I am a free prince of evil spirits. Oh, I'm gonna hurt my voice. What's good, legends? It is I, your boy. Today's video, sponsored by Magellan TV. Oh, what's Magellan? Mm. You've heard me talk about Magellan before. It's a new type of documentary streaming service founded by filmmakers. They believe that history is the best lens for understanding who and what we are as a species and where we're going. I think that's true. Look, we gotta look at the past. Otherwise, we're gonna make those same mistakes again. I mean, honestly, we're gonna make those same mistakes again anyway, aren't we? <laughs> It's like, yeah, 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 the uh, Second World War, genocide. We learned our lesson, there were no more genocides. Oh, oh wait, no, the, the, there were many more. And there will be many more in the future. Woo, genocide! I'm gonna have to re-record this, aren't I? Just to make it absolutely clear, I am being sarcastic. I don't think genocide is good, what? <laughs> Apocalypse? Nah. History's dumb doomsday pred I don't understand. Like, people predict the end of the world, right? Over and over again. And I'm like, this is literally an example of a no-win scenario. Okay, so there's two outcomes, right? The world ends, or it doesn't end. But 90% of the time... 100% of the time... 99.99999... It's not gonna end. Especially on the day that you predict. So, uh, on that one, you're wrong. On the other hand... It just happens to be the one time that you are correct, and the world ends, and you lose anyway. It's a lose-lose situation. Why on earth would you predict the end of the world? Oh, I'm into that shit! Be like, oh my god, look at that big brain! He predicted the end of the- <laughs> Burning in a nuclear holocaust. I mean, come on. Oh god, I've said like holocaust like twice in the first minute of this video. There's no way that I'm making money anymore. I'll probably just bleep that out or something. But you didn't. Now I've said it three times. Ah! <laughs> it's not a day that any of us would care to see. The Dark Lord Siros has finally been vanquished forever. Fleetwood Mac have split up for what they promise is definitely the last time. Simon has got his neon light fixed. I have not. I have not. Look, okay, let's try and fix this right now, shall we? Look, folks. Uh, what happens with the neon sign? Engineers out there. I'll turn it off, and then I'll turn it back on. It activates, it buzzes, and then it turns off. It might be something to do with this transformer here, which is a Hanson EVG 20-5 ELD. And its earth wire is alarmingly not connected to anything. <laughs> Ah! Um, I don't know if that's in Europe. Do we have Earths? No, I think uh, in Europe things are not Earth. They just have, like, any, any chance of something going wrong. It, like, flips the power off. That's how they do things here. Honestly, I'm not even sure if that's how it works. <laughs> I have no idea about electronics. But if someone wants to help me, engineers assemble! Hit the comments! All the loose plot threads have finally been tied up once and for all as we hurtle towards the end of the world. The Earth exhales one final, last, satisfying, if weary sigh of relief which echoes around the solar system as the planet winks out of existence and the end credits begin to roll down a blanket of darkness. There's nobody left alive to see the credit flashing up in the sky which confirms that the whole thing was based on original storyline by Joseph Stalin. What is going on? Suka, 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 bled, suka, 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 bled. Or the brief post-credit sequence, which displays a five-second YouTube clip of a drunken bloke falling down an escalator in one last all-encompassing tribute to humanity. There is, I mean, I get like the the drunk dude falling down the escalator. It's like so, man evolves, man invents alcohol, man later invents escalator, man with alcohol falls down an escalator. <laughs> humanity, legends, all of us. Even the drunk man falling down the escalator. I am not fucking drunk. But when exactly is the darkness going to descend? Don't raise it! There used to be a bloke who wandered around the streets of Sheffield City Centre every day wearing a sandwich board which displayed the doom-laden message, the end of the world is nigh. I first spotted him when I was a young kid and I found it to be quite a sinister and confusing experience. What inside information? did this guy have? Why was nobody else paying any attention to this incredible revelation? Yeah, ha. Huh. The years before children realized there's such a thing as a lie. 
So that was a fucking lie. About 25 years later, he was still going strong, but I now felt that he'd lost any trace of credibility in my more discerning eyes. I once tried stopping him to ask if he had any change for a five pound note for my bus fare. Danny, I'm just gonna guess that the man wandering around the street aimlessly with a sign that says the end of the world is nigh is not gonna have any money on him. Just a, just a gamble, there. I'm broke, I'm broke! But he marched on in complete oblivion to my request. I often thought that he wasn't really making the most out of his life, and it was weird how I never once saw anybody respond to the slight to the sight of him in any way. It was as if he had just melted into the fabric of the Sheffield landscape. And maybe we should ignore these dark warnings at our peril. It's true that mankind has been predicting the end of the world ever since we first learned how to communicate. We've always been a glass half empty kind of species in that regard. Oh my! This is stupendous! Wow, what a great show! But even the bloke with the sandwich board could be well proved right one day if he lives long enough. Yeah, it's really unlikely though, isn't it? Like, I mean, it's really unlikely that the world has been around, humans as a species have been around for a very long time. I mean, it's definitely more likely than it's ever been that the world is going to end because we have those wonderful things called nuclear weapons. But I really, it's, I do see it as unlikely that the world is going to end in my lifetime. Maybe that'll come back to bite me. When, you know, in 20 years, someone will be like, yeah, Simon definitely didn't predict asteroid 48960, did he? Ah! ah! Although I feel like if we had an asteroid, it would have been like called 48 whatever. We'd, we'd definitely have to give it a cool name. I think, you know, if we knew it was going to destroy us for sure, we'd have to give it an epic name. Like Doom Slayer. Oh yeah, <laughs> all, the, all the papers would be like, Doom Slayer inches closer to Earth. And by inches, we mean moves forward at thousands of miles an hour. <laughs> Doom Slayer begin! Uh, but even the bloke with the sandwich board could well be proved right one day if he lives long enough. And some of these people must know what they're talking about. I don't know what makes you assume that, Danny. However, since we're sadly not able to bring you a video which covers in detail all of those memorable times when Doomsday predictions turned out to be quite impressively accurate. <laughs> Sounds like you're just being lazy on the research there, Danny, doesn't it? Doesn't it? We'll have to make do with some of the other Doomsday predictions that have clearly been ever so slightly miscalculated. Farmageddon's magic chicken. <laughs> Christians appear to have been looking forward to the second coming of Christ for quite some time now. What? And it's hard to see why, really, because it sounds to me as if things are going to get very messy after he puts in his return appearance. According to the book of Revelation, only 144,000 true believers will be saved and given a free VIP pass to the kingdom of heaven after Jesus shows up again to host the end of the world. <laughs> That's fucking dark, isn't it? He's gonna kill, like, 7 billion people. Uh, however many million. 144,000 true believers. I, I promise you, there are more. Look, I don't know, I'm not a brilliant at maths. But I promise you there are more than 144,000 true believers in Jesus. Although, look, if you're watching this and you're like, I'm a good Christian, it's like, oh, but do you doubt just a little bit? Sometimes it's late at night. Do you lie in bed and wonder, I've never heard from God. I talk to him a lot, but he's never once spoken to me. Do you ever begin to doubt and be like, oh, maybe he's not real? And if he has spoken to you, I'd recommend consulting a mental health practitioner. Because it's okay to speak to God. It's not okay for him to speak to you. Everybody else on the planet, including the other 3.2 billion Christians, I knew it was a lot more than 144,000, uh, who didn't make the cut, will have to put up with famine, disease, torment, a pesky locust infestation, and the general long-winded devastation of the earth. Look, famine, there's gonna be enough food, okay? I mean, at least for, for me, I'll be fine. I've got a basement, I'll stock it up. Disease, pfft. We've got cures for disease. COVID came along, it's like, ah, ah, global pandemic, please. I mean, it killed millions of people, which I suppose is bad, but we, we kind of gain that control now. Torments. Yeah, that sounds bad. Joke's on you, I'm into that shit. Locusts, we've invented raid. Bug spray, not shadow legends. Uh, uh, what else? Devastation, oh. Well, look, okay, let's move on. You can see why some people tend to get a bit twitchy about the whole idea, and this is why the townsfolk of Leeds in the north of England. What is with the north of England and predicting the world? Stop it. No. No, I don't think I will. 
into meltdown back in 1806 when they received a clear message that Jesus was coming back. It was a bit strange that the message popped out the backside of a chicken. Mary Bateman owned several domesticated chickens at the time, but only one of them had a habit of laying eggs, which contained a prophecy of doom. She was quick to raise the alarm when she first spotted that one of her hens had laid an egg with the words Christ is coming engraved into the outer shell. Mary, you're a, either, either you did this or you're a bit dumb because someone did this and then put the egg back. Uh, also, <laughs> I went to a religious school and we had to go to chapel like twice a week and the Christ is coming thing reminds you, you know, I don't know, look, non-religious people or people who haven't been to church or whatever, you, there's this thing you have to read, I don't even know what it's called, but at some point in it, it's like the, the preacher or whatever, the priest says, Christ has risen. And then everyone in the audience, you have it on your little thing, you say, Christ will come again. What? As it, it's not funny at all now, I think back in it in retrospect, but the funniest thing in the world was uh, as 13 year old, 14 year old boys. Uh, like someone definitely in the row would always be like, because you know, it's really loud, you can't really hear. It'd just be like, Christ will come again. <laughs> oh my God, it's not funny at all to anyone watching this, but to me and my childhood humor of just sh someone shouting out that Jesus is gonna come is, uh, it was the height of sophisticated humor to a 13 year old boy. That's the coolest fucking story I've ever heard in my entire life. That's insane. Can I hear it again? Jesus will come again. What? And although this might sound like a scam or misinterpretation, the people of Leeds <laughs> still thinking about Jesus coming. Ha! Gay! Like sexually, not physically arriving somewhere, just in case that's not clear. Daddy, chill. And although this might be seem, sound like a scam or misinterpretation, the people of Leeds who got an opportunity to witness this miracle for themselves firsthand. Over the next few weeks, the soothsayers hen drew in crowds of thousands and continued to lay further eggs, bearing the exact same carved message right before their very eyes. Why did I just pronounce very as very? What is actually wrong with me? Very eyes. Do you speak English? No, I don't, sorry. Uh, this led to widespread panic and hysteria across the town, although Mary Bateman, who had garnered a reputation as the Yorkshire Witch, was in a position to calm the anxieties of those who had a shilling to spare. Ah, so it's a classic scam. Every visitor was offered the chance to buy one of Mary's special homemade seals, which she claimed guaranteed one of the 144,000 seats reserved for heaven. <laughs> They were actually just scraps of paper upon which Mary had scribbled the initials JC, but they were selling like half-price egg McMuffins, so the end of the world was proving to be a nice little earner for Mary. Mary, you're gonna get burned. However, a local doctor had grown a tan suspicious of the magic chicken, took him bloody long enough. After spying on Mary for several nights, he eventually discovered that the witch had been taking a freshly laid egg, dabbing the message on with vinegar, and then shoving it right back up the poor hen's oviduct. My, my, my. I guess they did see the egg come out. <laughs> it's like, must be proof. Nope, the crazy woman shoved that egg up the oviduct. I didn't even know it was an oviduct. The more you know, you're welcome. By the time the hen laid the egg again, the vinegar had dissolved the shell very slightly, giving the impression that the message had been engraved into the egg, while still very much inside the hen. No action was ever taken against Mary, as the police weren't really invented in Leeds until 1836. They called her a witch though. When did they stop burning people at the stake for that Because, I mean, she's a prime candidate. And this was quite handy for the witch who often indulged in robbery and fake charity collecting during her enchanting career. Mary, Mary, Mary. <laughs> she didn't get away with murder, though. Uh-oh. After convincing the local woman, Rebecca P P Perigo, that her chest pains were the result of being placed under an evil curse, Mary managed to swindle bucket loads of money out of her victim over a long period by providing her with magic charms and healing potions. When Rebecca's... I don't know if that's really on Mary on that one, is it? <laughs> Like, I know it's a con, but Rebecca, you shouldn't be buying that shit, should you? Buyer beware and all that. Mary's just a believer in the free market. Oh, when Rebecca's, but she is what I would call capitalism while being a dick. Like, don't, we've discussed this before. I love capitalism. Quite a fan of the free market. But just let's not be a dick, okay? Not hard. Don't be a dick. When Rebecca's money ran out, Mary Hatz was keen to cover her tracks, so she made sure that the final healing potion was six packets of poison, uh, which the victim was advised to mix into her puddings. Whoops, a doodle. Following Rebecca's death, Mary is found guilty of murder. Excellent. And hanged in York in 1809. Weirdly, uh, her body was later put on display at Leeds General Infirmary, where visitors were charged three pence a pop to take a look at the dead Yorkshire witch. Sounds about fair, doesn't it, considering what she was doing earlier? And it took until 2015 for the Thackeray Museum in Leeds to withdraw her skeleton from exhibition after deciding that it wasn't entirely tasteful. 
<laughs> hey, look at this crazy old witch bones. It's like museums, you're supposed to be tasteful. No. No, I don't think I will. Although museums are often just really not taste. I know they're like, this is a mummy from Egypt. And it's like, yeah, but you can see his, his missing face. <laughs> I don't think that's tasteful. It's fascinating, not tasteful. Jokes on you, I'm into that shit. I mean, if it was, if it was tasteful, people would be like, rich people would be like, I'm gonna have a mummy, mummy displayed in my house. That would be some haunted <laughs> If hauntings were real, you're gonna get haunted the out of. Mary had tried to pull one last scam before her execution by claiming that she was pregnant. It was illegal to hang a pregnant woman in many cases. The women were pardoned after giving birth. A physical examination concluded that she was telling porkies again, and Mary wasn't about to lay another very dubious egg. Ah! Haley's Comet. I was only very young at the time, but I can still vaguely remember the comet massive buzz that was sweeping the world in February 1986 when Haley's Comet was scheduled to make a rare appearance. I'm pretty sure everyone was going through a period of pronouncing the name wrong back then. Haley's Comet. Right? It's not Hawley's Comet or Halley's Comet, it's Haley's Comet. Although the name is meant to rhyme with Valley. Halley. Oh, really? So that was a fucking lie. Most people seemed to pronounce it Haley, a confusion that was possibly sparked by memories of the 1950s rock band Bill Haley and his Comets. Really? A few moments later. Seems like I'm with everyone else pronouncing it wrong, but let's see what my pronunciation dude says. 75 years later. Ali! Oh my god! I bet I'm not the only one getting that wrong, and all the big brains are gonna be like, Simon, ah ha, everyone pronounces it Ali's Comet. Uh, what are you, tiny brains? Yes! Yes! Although Ali's Comet, and I'm gonna say it correctly from now on, alright, has been observed since at least 240 BC and makes and even makes appearance on the Bayer Tapestry. It wasn't until 1705 that British astronomer Edmund Halley figured out that everybody had been observing the same celestial body all of these years, and the comet took his name following this discovery. Big brain Edmund Hale Halley. Mm -hmm. The ball of icy dust is the only short period comet that can be regularly visible to the naked eye, popping up every 76 years. So unless you live a long, healthy life, which just happens to span the right dates, the viewing of the comet is usually considered to be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I was born in 1987, so I just missed it the first time around. Hopefully, I'll be around for the next one. Uh, I need to make some lifestyle adjustments. <laughs> And that's why I was excited back in 1986 when I got a chance to gaze at Halley's Comet in all its breathtaking glory. Except I think back in 86, wasn't it one of the worst viewings uh, in, in recent history? Unfortunately, it was absolute pants. Apparently so. Uh, although the event had been hyped up on the news for ages, it turned out to be a massive anticlimax because nobody could see a damn thing. The Earth and the Comet were on opposite sides of the Sun as the Comet passed, creating the worst possible viewing for over 2,000 years. <laughs> 76 years earlier, the comet had made a much more dramatic impact when it passed in 1910. But that's partly because in the weeks leading up to, a, to the appearance, a big chunk of the population was convinced that Halley's Comet was going to destroy the world. I've heard of this. Didn't they think, like, in the back of the comet there was some weird gas? Or they knew it? And they were like, yeah, yeah, it's going to go through the atmosphere and kill us all. They were incorrect. We're all going to die! Ah! It had already been noted that this time around, the comet was destined to get particularly close to the Earth so that it would actually pass through the comet's tail, leading to fears of a devastating collision. But a bigger concern to arise from this potential cuddle with the comet was brought up by respected French astronomer Camille Flammarion, who discovered through spectral analysis that the comet's tail contained the deadly gas cyanogen, which could potentially spread toxic fumes across the Earth. In his own blunt words, Camille reckoned that when the Earth passed through the comet's tail, the gas would impregnate the atmosphere and possibly snuff out all life on this planet. Camille, shut your mouth. <laughs> You're just guessing, and everyone's going to get really scared. This led to a flurry of newspaper headlines along the lines of Comet may kill all life on Earth, which in turn led to a brief period of comic panic across the globe, although mostly it seems in America. The New York Times reported that a large chunk of the population in Chicago had been gripped by doomsday terror, while the Atlanta Constitution newspaper revealed that the good people of Georgia were preparing safe rooms and even covering keyholes with paper to avoid inhaling the death fumes of the evil eye in the sky. <laughs> so how are we gonna stop this gas rain? Paper over the keyholes! <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> 
One guy who seems like my kind of guy told reporters that he had armed himself with a gallon of whiskey and requested that his friends lower him to the bottom of a 40 feet deep dry well. Meanwhile, some sharp-witted entrepreneurial soul seized the opportunity to flog loads of gas masks, comet pills, and bottled air to concerned citizens. <laughs> comet pills. I get the bottle there. I get the gas masks. I mean, those could be relatively sensible if, if done properly. Although, I get the feeling if the gas comes into the atmosphere, right, it's not like it's just going to suddenly pass and everything will be fine. How, how much air you got? About 90 minutes? Yeah, I don't think that's going to be enough. Stand, it's gone. Not everyone was caught up in the horror, though. While the day the comet, when the day the comet, when the day of the comet arrived, many celebratory citizens were holding wild rooftop comet parties across the world. Although mostly, it seems, in America, and these people had the right idea. Apparently, the unusually close passing of Halley's comet in 1910 proved to be a truly spectacular sight to behold. And just as other astronomers had tried to, tried to point out to the public, the gases in the tail of the comet were completely harmless, as they were diffused to the point that they were thinner than any vacuum. That is thin. So the best thing to do is to watch wash the comet pills down the sink and just enjoy the view shame the same thing can't be said for the 1986 saint show roll on 2061 and what else should you roll on to oh boy yes that is today's glorious sponsor magellan tv magellan tv is what is a new type of documentary streaming membership oh I believe they used to say, they were like, Simon, we've updated our talking points. It's no longer a service, it is a membership. I shouldn't criticize the points, but I guess, I mean, it is a membership. You, you pay for it. It's, you, you become a member of Magellan TV, and as a member of Magellan TV, you're granted access to glorious documentaries without commercials. They believe in his the history is the best lens for understanding who and what we are as a species. I mentioned that at the beginning of today's video. As a result, what? What does Magellan have? You better believe that it has the richest and most varied history content available anywhere. Is that true? That's pretty great. I mean, their selection is huge. But I mean, lots of places have a huge selection. I didn't realize that it was actually the case. Ancient, modern, current, early modern, war. Wow, I mean, modern, current, early modern. <laughs> We're breaking it down niche. Uh, war biography and other genres bring the past to life in their own way, like science and true crime. You'd probably be into that. I mean, if you're watching this video and enjoying us over all these crazy people, you're probably into science. You should check out some science documentaries. The team of producers also, and cu uh, curators, scads, or if you're really like into, yeah, burn those witches! True crime might be for you. Their team of producers and curators scours the world for the very best, best documentary content and smartest perspectives. Magellan TV has 3,000 documentaries to choose from. If you watch the documentary every day, that's almost 10 years before you'd be done. Good lord. I mean, although I'm sure there's something you'd find really boring. Like, I look on there sometimes, and I'll be quite frank, it's like, pff, I would've watched that in a thousand years. I'd never sit, I just wouldn't. I'd be like, I'd just rather sit on my sofa and look at the black screen of the TV than watch that. Because look, people have personal preferences, and it's okay not to like everything. Plenty of people don't like business plays because it's a bit weird and shit. Wow, what a great show! Uh, but look, they're gonna have stuff that you do love. I should focus on the positives, because the reality is, you look on Magellan, 99% of the stuff, you're like, that looks awesome, that looks awesome, I should watch that, I wish I had more hours in the day to watch all of this. Uh, look, there's, um, even better growing selection of new shows available in 4K without additional cost. That's nice. No commercial interruptions. Also nice. Uh, please make personal recommendations about the content you've read. Well, let's have a look and see what I've been watching lately! That's what we'll do. We'll do it live! Oh yeah, this is a solid one. I mean, eh, it's not super related to what we're talking about in today's video, but I mean, you guys are like, it's a good show. It's a really good show. And I mean, if you like war content and battle content and kind of like history of war and stuff, the battlefields of the world wars, it's worth a watch. Definitely check it out. Uh, Mega Projects viewers, that's you. No. <laughs> Magellan, what have you done? Business Blaze viewers will get a one month free trial by clicking the link in the description below. Ah, oh, why not check that out? Let's get back to the video. The number of the beast. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Although this is another insightful fried golden nugget of wisdom taken from one of the millions of interpretations of the Book of Revelation, it sounds more like an opening voiceover from a cheesy 1960s drama series. I can easily envision the opening long shot of a horned figure waving his pitchfork at the sky and yelling, I am not a weight. I am not a number. I am 
A free prince of evil spirits. Oh, I'm gonna hurt my voice. Calm yourself, Simon. Thanks for the sky. I just like to, you know, I like to bring the drama and the passion to you guys. And sometimes I have to sacrifice my own personal well-being. You can reward me for such things by getting Magellan or purchasing my merch at purchthemerch.co because that's how I make money. I love money. Thanks to the discovery of new fragments from the earliest surviving copy of the Bible, it's now believed that heavy metal bands have been getting it embarrassingly wrong for all of these years, and the real number of the beast is 616. No! But they didn't know that back in the 17th century London, and back then there was a growing sense of doom as the calendar moved ominously closer to the year 1666. An extreme Christian group called the Fifth Monarchy Men, no girls allowed in that club, obviously, held an alarmingly strong influence over English and Welsh, Welsh societies and politics for well over a decade, and the group was convinced that the forthcoming arrival of the year 1666 would spell the end of days for mankind. The clue was apparently in the number. The Fifth Monarchists spent most of the, 90, uh, the 1650s spreading the word that 1666 would herald the final showdown between the returning Jesus Christ and the Antichrist, the latter of whom they believed to be currently disguised as the Pope. Wow, I mean... Is it crack? Is that what you smoke? Do you smoke crack? That is, I mean, in all the history of like double agents and shit, if the Pope turned out to be a spy for the enemy, you'd be like That'd be like the president turning out to be like a KGB agent. That'd be some crazy ass shit. Suka, 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 blad, suka, 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 blad. Uh, it was destined to be the biggest pay-per-view boxing match in history and would climax with the end of earthly rule by human beings. <laughs> biggest pay-per-view in history. They've never heard of Jake Paul then, have they? <laughs> oh, cringe. The first worrying thing about this prophecy is just how many people bought into it. The Fifth Monarchist had over 10,000 followers, all of whom were convinced that the end of the world was ever ever closer. But an even more disturbing point is that the prophecy appeared to be coming true. For Londoners, at least. In 1665, Old London Town was struck by the terrible bubonic plague that wiped, wiped out a fifth of its population. <laughs> Savage, but a coincidence, because none of this is actually real. I mean, the bubonic plague is real. Unquestionably, wiping out a fifth of London's population, absolutely real. This being caused by the devil number 1666, in 1665, categorically false and a bit silly. It's hard for us nowadays to imagine what it must have been like to live through a ghastly pandemic. And the people of the time believed that this was just phase one of Doomsday. Phase two swung into it. I bet there are COVID cults. Are there people? I bet there are. Phase 2 swung into action the following year, the year of the actual beast, when London found itself consumed in the fires of hell. Oh, was 1666 the Great Fire of London? I said, oh Lord Jesus, it's a fire! Here's a bonus fake fact which everyone thinks is true. Most people say that the Great Fire of London first bro broke out a little bakehouse in Pudding Lane in 1666. I don't think, I, I think they don't know where it broke out, is that right? In fact, the bakehouse was situated in an unnamed enclave just off Pudding Lane, but historians have found it easier to just name to just name Pudding Lane as the nearest point of reference. Oh, okay, so it was. I thought I thought that was like one of those fake facts. I didn't know how it was fake, but it's just the street name. Well, not such a big brain today, am I? I'm dumb, I'm a hillbilly, <laughs> but I can twerk. Whatever the exact location, the Great Fire ripped through the city for five days, destroying tens of thousands of homes and 87 parish churches, and badly damaging historical landmarks such as St. Paul's Cathedral. And as the residents of the city, still fighting with an invisible plague, now found themselves consumed by a raging inferno, it's perhaps understandable that many people believe the dark prophecy was coming true before their very eyes. Even I, at that point, would be like, oh, I mean, this it's not real. It's really not real. But oh my god, it looks pretty real, doesn't it? Ah! Why are you crying? And there was no need to make any concrete plans to book a summer holiday for 1667. It was never proved who was responsible for starting the fire. It definitely wasn't Billy Joel. Oh, put a boom, boom. And although the Frenchman Robert Hubert was hanged for the crime, this was only because he was an idiot who gave a fake confession. What are you doing? I put a fiver on one of those fifth monarchy men. And here's another fake fact which everyone thinks is true. Danny, this isn't the script for this. For God's sake. It's often speculated that the Great Fire of London at least helped to wipe out the plague, but the truth is that the plague had already largely subsided before the fire broke out, and it never stretched into the slum suburbs where the plague was still the most prevalent. Wait, guys. We've been working on a vaccine. All we need to do is set our cities on fire. Don't do that. I'm just joking. Please don't do that. Burn them all. 
It's also got nothing to do with 5G, we'll just head that off at the pass. It's often speculated that the Great Fire of London at least helped to wipe out the plague, but the truth is that the plague had already largely subsided before the fire broke out. Wait, I already said that. <laughs> After the flames were finally extinguished, it was officially reported there were only about eight or nine fatalities from the epic blaze. The real death toll is unknown and likely to be significantly higher than that, considering the number of local burials increased by a third that year. This is like some North Korea numbers on, uh... Yeah, yeah, no one died. No one died in the famine! They just became other people through consuming their flesh! The real death toll, um, b -b 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 and the whole city stank of burnt flesh for many weeks to follow. I remember when there was BSE. Anyone else remember BS? No, it wasn't BSE. There was some other disease. Maybe it was foot and mouth disease. Maybe it was BSE. But they were burning loads of cows. And I lived in the countryside and you could smell the burning cow. And it kind of smelled good. How dare you? But still, it wasn't quite the end of the world. And Jesus proved to be a no-show again as the battered residents of London celebrated the arrival of 1667. Besides, if it believed in all this number of the beast malarkey, I think he would have been more concerned a thousand years earlier in the year 666. Yes, but he wouldn't because none of it's real. <laughs> Y2K, I remember this one. Finally, moving into more recent history, the arrival of the third millennium. The year 2000. It brought with it its usual outpouring of particularly predictable predictions and pitiful prophecies of perdition. Thank you, Danny, for that. Uh, for starters, Jesus was meant to be coming back yet again to celebrate both his 2000th anniversary and the dawn of the new millennium. It's a pretty gay party, Jesus. You could have shown up. Even though because he's a time-traveling wizard. I'm a what? A wizard, Harry. Even though Jesus was meant to have been born between 6 and 4 BC, and the new millennium didn't officially start until 2001 anyway. But the biggest concern in 1999 was the impact of the Y2K bug, often inaccurately described as the Millennium Bug. It was a concern that I never really got my head around at the time. It was a problem first noted back in the 1970s, but it seems that nobody bothered to do anything about it for the next 29 years and just waited until 1999 to start panicking. Computer coders had always used six digits to account for a date, with the final two digits counting for the, for the year, so 1999 would simply be represented as 99. This was apparently a logical way of, of conserving sparse computer memory at the time, and it was fine until you hit the start of a whole new century, because when the computer clocks hit zero, zero, they didn't realize that they're moving forward in time another year because they hadn't been built with the capacity to comprehend a time span lasting more than two digits or a hundred years so instead of moving forward to 2000 the computer would assume that time had moved back to 1900 but i couldn't see why this was such a big deal my microwave has displayed the wrong time on it for the last five years oh my god anyone's house i go to where the 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 clocks on the oven and microwave and shit say the correct time i'm like oh my god you have your shit together <laughs> Because mine is just constantly wrong or flashing 12. I don't know what. I mean, because every time you turn off the power, there's a power card, or it's like, I don't know, my light hob is one of those like induction hobs, which I don't know. I'm just, I'm just going to go for gas next time. Because it's like, oh no, it got too hot. And it's like, what do you f about? You're a hob. You're supposed to get hot. Is hob just the British way of saying it? It's where you, what you cook food on, you know, you put a pan on it. And so you've got to flip off the power and turn it back on again so it starts working again. And every time I do that, it turns off the power to all of the kitchen appliances. And of course, I'm not going to reset the time on them because I have to do with my life. But I do admire what are we talking about. But I, I just do admire people who have their there enough to reset those things or even to know how or to have not immediately thrown away the manual to their oven after purchasing it. You're the heroes we need. However, some computers that was rents. <laughs> Let's get back to this thing. Some the, the thing, I mean the script. Thank you, Danny. So, however, some computer analysts pointed out that this issue could send most important computer systems in the world into chaotic meltdown. Banking systems would get confused as they attempted to calculate the interest rates after time had apparently slipped backwards by 100 years. Hospital systems would collapse. Airplanes would drop out of the sky. Elevators would either stop working or plummet from the very top of skyscrapers. Seems unlikely. The world economy would come to a grinding halt and all the world's nuclear weapons would accidentally be fired at each other. And some supervisors would completely run out of a bongo. No! Not the Umbungo. Could you tell that I don't really care? Uh, it looked as if the end of the world had been brought about not by politicians or war, but by computer programmers, those absolute douchebags. 
all of them. And it was noted, just joking. And it was noted this was largely down to human modesty. When the early coders came up with their quick fixes and hacks back in the 70s and 80s, they'd always assumed that somebody else would come along and update or and improve their work in the near future. They never imagined for a second that they would be creating fundamentally important code that would last for decades. So, while some cynics may have long argued that the apocalypse uh, would be sparked by human greed and hatred, it now seems as if the apocalypse had been sparked by sheer humility. I think I am actually humble. I think I'm much more humble than you would understand. In the days leading up to the year 2000, sales of guns and non-perishable foods soared as the smart survivalists prepared for a post-Holocaust future. The British government announced that its armed forces would be, uh, be prepared and ready for assistance if required. But it turned out that nothing much happened. A couple of cash terminals in the UK stopped working, and a few people got sent bills through the post which had the wrong date on them. Hardly cause for global panic. And also, you know immediately what's wrong. It's not like, oh yeah, I got an electric bill. It says 1900. I'm not going to pay that. Obviously, you just pay it because you know what's going on. A total of $300 billion had been spent around the world in upgrading computer systems to deliver protection against the doomsday bug, about a third of which was spent in the US alone. Bloody hell. But it's now believed that it was completely unnecessary, even if it did mean that important institutions at least, uh, at last, ended up with better computers. If we were conspiracy theorists, we could speculate that the whole Y2K bug was deliberately drummed up by the computer industry in order to put in a bill for $300 billion worth of unnecessary work. That is immediately what entered my mind. <laughs> if that turns out to be true, then hats off to them. This might have been a scheme so fiendishly cunning that it could have only been hatched by a fortune-telling chicken of doom. Oh, I love the callback, Danny. This has been an episode of Business Blaze brought to you by the legends over at Magellan. There is a link below to Magellan. Also, if you'd like to purchase some merch, why don't you do so at purchthemerch.co? You can pick up this fine Keep Calm and Blaze on t-shirt. Yes, it is available in green, and thank you for watching.